10 years ago, if you what well, we talked about the host genetics have an uh, impact on the microbial colonization and the human researchers or many researchers well really love just they just laugh at it. They say that's impossible. You know, remember, or, or the gut microbes is most affected by environment, diet, and so on. Host genetics has minimal role. But if you really look at or, or following the literature, even in human study, you know, there is a tremendous, a tremendous knowledge now that genetics play a role. So I think the 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 novelty is it's always the combination of many factors working together to drive the 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 the, the bio, biological process right so even like microbes play a role it's not necessarily always 100 percent of the microbes host of course play a role hello and welcome to the beef podcast show my name is dr stephanie hansen i'm a feedlot nutritionist at iowa state university and our guest today is Dr. Lilu Guan, who is a professor of functional genomics and microbiology in the Department of Agricultural, Food, and Nutritional Science at the University of Alberta, Canada. Dr. Guan has published more than 120 peer-reviewed articles to date, and her research program focuses on bovine functional genomics involving establishing a link with, between omics and economically important traits in livestock species using transcriptome and proteome profiling through high-throughput techniques. Elucidation of the molecular mechanisms of host microbial interactions by studying the associations between the bovine gut microbiome and feed efficiency, methane emission, and gut immunity development in beef and dairy cattle using a metagenomics and metatranscriptomics approach. Currently, she is supervising eight PhD and one master's student, as well as two postdocs and two technicians. And I am exhausted just reading that list. So welcome to the show, Lilu. Thank you. Okay, and I apologize if anybody can hear any of the construction noise going on in my background. I'm recording in our animal science building and we are replacing the roof apparently this summer. So fun times in summer construction. <laughs> All right. Well, we're so glad to um, visit with you today. And actually, you and I just saw each other up in Montreal not too long ago at the Canadian Nutrition Conference. That was the first time I had ever been up there, but that was a really fabulous conference. Um, maybe let's start by talking about that a little bit before we talk about your story. Um, is that a conference that you've attended pretty regularly? Um, actually, that was, that, that was also my first um, conference experience in the, um, I think it's a um, Canadian Animal Science, uh, an Animal Nutrition Conference. Yeah, actually, that was my first experience as well. Yeah, well, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a really good mix of um, industry and uh, academics across everything. I mean, there was a gal from Catalonia. There was, you know, some people, um, uh, I think Australians and some others. So that was it was a really cool international mix. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay, so let's start out by hearing about your story. So how did you eventually get to your position where you are today and lead you to some of your passion that's related here to uh, rumen microbiology? Um, yeah, that, that, that's a really good question. I guess um, if I want to talk about it, it can be um, hours and hours, but maybe I'll try to make it uh, um, as brief as I can. So um, actually I was trained um, in microbiology uh, in China and actually in Wuhan, I think now because of COVID, everyone knows Wuhan. So, um, and then I, I went to Japan, I get my master and PhD in uh, pharmaceutical science and, and also a um, minor in biochemistry. And then, um, then I actually worked on marine microbiology. So microbiology is always my passion. And um, I think in 2020, we decided to move to Canada. Um, the, the reason I chose Alberta is because of I, we, we had a friend here, so we just decided to come here to, you know, to not say enjoy the, the winter, but um, just want to um, have a you know, new page of life. And, you know, I think in, I lived in Japan for 11 years before I decided to move here. And before I moved to Canada, I was working on um, marine uh, microbiology and look at microbial ecology, you know, how the uh, marine ecosystem can be, uh, you know, microbiology affect the whole, you know, the marine food chain, right? So like a global warming, red, um, you know, green algae blooming and how microbes play a role. So my first job in Alberta actually is working on chicken gut microbiota. So I actually, um, one time we isolated microbes from crop from, you know, 100 chicken. And then, you know, the, 
I really enjoyed to looking at, you know, microbes in the animal system. So we actually start to develop how to identify the microbes can affect uh, the chicken function. And it's somehow the life just, uh, you know, there is always things happen. So my uh, uh, supervisor at the time decided to move back to Australia. So then, and in a way that somehow I got a chance to work with Dr. Steve Moore, who is the uh, you know leading researcher in the bovine genomics. So he established a very large program on bovine genomics. And in the meantime, the program uh, started to look at all the genome types of the beef cattle in the Kinsella Ranch at the University of Alberta. And the key trait is R5 residue feed intake and feed efficiency. So at the time, the main program is identify genetics and how uh, identify genetic markers or molecular breeding strategy to improve feed efficiency of the beef cattle. So my role was actually on genome sequencing of the bovine uh, at the time. So I was asked to, he, he asked me to lead a group with two technicians and one postdoc trying to do the full genome sequencing. And through that uh, research, I had a lot of uh, visits in the farm <laughs> working with cattle. So in, in our Chinese culture, sometimes is uh, we, we have a kind of a term. So sometimes they say you play a uh, guitar in front of cows or so cows don't usually, you know, respond or understand. But when I do those bovine genome uh, project, I had a lot of chance to go to visit farm. And I start to become really love the cattle. To be honest, I grew up in big city. I never work with cattle. I really don't know about cattle. So um, since 2005, when we start to get more and more samples collecting, you know, DNA samples or blood or hair samples from cattle, I start to think about how the microbiology, you know, can I use my passion about microbiology that somehow to be part of this program. So then I start to read rumen microbiome, rumen microbiology, and I was fascinated because rumen microbiology is the most well-established research field in 1960, in 1970, and the whole diet affect microbiome, uh, microbes and their function has really, really extensively started way be, you know, ahead of human microbiome research. So I would actually really say that all the human research these days are actually just follow what has been done in rumen microbiome in 1960s, 70s. So then I start to think about would this microbes could somehow, because what we found is when we look at uh, RFI or feed efficiency, in the growing, under the growing diet, the animals can be ranked. But when we switch to feedlot diet, 50% of feed efficiency ranking actually will re-rank. So animal is the same genetics and they raise the same farm, but it's only diet to change the RFI re-ranking. They will be 50% of them are somehow different. Used to be low you know, feed efficiency or high feed efficiency when they change diet, they, their rank somehow uh, converted. So I start to think about because diet can affect rumen microbes. So the key question is, would microbes play a role that somehow, you know, affecting their metabolites and contribute to the feed efficiency re-ranking? So I think that's where I started to collect rumen samples. So my first job as assistant professor is actually went to slaughterhouse, <laughs> collect rumen samples from 198 steers uh, of our farm within 90 minutes, I still remember. So I was really appreciated the time they allow me uh, to go to the solid house and stand in the line, cut the room and in the end of the room, <laughs> collect samples. I really thought about, I'm like a chaplain moving, you know, collecting the samples within a very fast time. So then that was allow me to actually, uh, I was so lucky to collect the rumen samples from those 198 steers, which raised in our beef farm. They have genome typing, they have uh, the uh, residue feed intake measurement. And we start really start to think about uh, or what to look at what, uh, you know, whether the cattle with different efficiency have different rumen microbes and how the microbes may have different functions or how they potentially contribute to uh, the feed efficiency. So since then, I've been working on this particular uh, area for almost, um, 
I guess, 16 or 17 years. And, you know, in addition to identify rumen microbes, now we identified rumen fun uh, microbial functions, but also now we also uh, had opportunity to identify host uh, genetics or genetic markers, how they potentially regulate or select which rumen microbes and those rumen microbes could be heritable and also impact on uh, the feed efficiency. I think that's part of the kind of a short uh, story on this area. Well, I want to jump into the feed efficiency work first, uh, because one of the things I think that's really cool about your program is that if you kind of picture a Venn diagram and you think about room and microbiology and genetics, these are sometimes people that would not necessarily be attending the same conference or be having the same communications. But really, you're looking at the overlap, right? The Venn diagram, if we put those two circles together and say kind of how does one potentially interact with the other or one describe the other. So what do you think are some of the most interesting insights that you've gained from your work as you think about putting room in microbiology and kind of functional genomics together in this feed efficiency space? Well, I guess the, the most important is really about interdisciplinary, right? So it's the marriage of uh, um, and the traditionally and um, not necessary, um, you know, uh, collaborative or married uh, fields. So in old, well, I guess if 10 years ago, if you what we talked about the host genetics have an uh, impact on the microbial colonization and the human researchers or many researchers well really love just they just laugh at it they say that's impossible you know remember or, or the gut microbes is most affected by environment diet and so on. host genetics has minimal role but if you really look at or, or following the literature, even in human study, you know, there is a tremendous, a tremendous knowledge now that genetics play a role. So I think the, 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 the novelty is it's always the combination of many factors working together to drive the, 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 the bio, biological process, right? So even like microbes play a role, it's not necessarily always 100% of the microbes. Host, of course, play a role. So this is always kind of an interaction what we, uh, what we meant. So for example, these days, most of people are always talking about uh, everything is microbiome. Actually, personally, I disagree because based on our experience, we actually uh, performed a study looking at uh, how the rumen microbiome, how much rumen microbiome and its metabolites contribute to rumen development. And based on our research, we found actually rumen microbiome can only contribute up to 30% of the rumen development and a host genetics and a host the gene expression, host the genetic variation contribute up to 70% of the rumen development. So it's always the combination of different, um, you know, variables working together to affect particular traits. I think the host, um, whether it's the host genetics or the host eating behavior or any of those other things, right, could be a learned behavior that they learned from mom while they were out grazing range or something like that. You know, that's kind of best described in some of that, the studies, right, where they looked at like the different milk milk efficiency, right, in dairy cows and had ruminally fistulated dairy cows, high and low efficiency. And then they basically rumen, you know, vacuumed out those rumens and swapped them. And I can't remember the exact time frame, but it's within a few to several weeks, basically the efficiency went back to where they started and those microbial populations had reestablished. So clearly there is something about, you know, a microclimate in the rumen that's a certain pH or, you know, that certain selection that one cow eats more hay than corn or any of a whole variety of things, right? So I like that you have a holistic approach because it does seem like sometimes microbiology has become this like, oh, if we could just fix the gut microbe thing, that would solve all of our problems. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Actually, I, I was um, discussing a very interest perspective, maybe um, of your interest is, so, um, in a couple of years, and you know, we have been working on well, not me, uh, uh, Dr. Ed Edward Borg, working on the grazing cattle, and they always trying to you know uh, link the grazing behavior to the feed efficiency, and they do see that uh, for the uh, more efficient animal, they spend less time to go to look food, you know, spend less you know energy burning to work around and so on, um, but also that kind of a behavior could also depends on what food or feed they may intake, right? Depends on where they go in the uh, Perry, uh, you know, the lands or what forages intake, it also affect rumen function. And the rumen fermentation would possibly affect their energy metabolism and so on. So it's all connected. 
Yeah, absolutely. So one of my thoughts as you were talking out there was, as we think about the producer, right, you know, so we have breeds that have EPDs for RFI or, or residual gain, whichever your different breeds are, right? Um, what are your thoughts on how beef producers can make selection, you know, use this as a selection criteria? Yeah, that, that's a really good question, because um, I think based on our recent um research we just published two well i guess two years ago we actually identified the SNPs that are actually associated with heritable rumen microbes and those SNPs are also are genetic markers for dmi uh, dry mat intake and r5 rest of it intake so i speculate if we can incorporate those SNPs into the ebv or you know estimate breeding value through the genetic uh, selection, uh, I think potentially can improve the cattle with potentially colonize more. We desired the microbes that they, you know, have better fiber degradation, or they can produce more, for example, propionate or acetate and so on. Second perspective is if the cattle may not have those genetics or they don't have those markers, if we can, you know, based on genetic evaluation, we know that those cattle may not be able to colonize those rumen microbes. We can use the nutritional strategy, right? We can supplement the cattle with those microbes. So which is that that's what I, I am interested in right now is how to translate those uh, knowledge is we can actually um, make the products like direct fat microbes of those rumen microbes to the cattle who cannot colonize or who do not colonize with those microbes. So in a way that we can help the cattle to be more efficiently digest the feed, uh, you know, the material to generate more uh, energy source for them. Yeah, you went right to where my next question was going to be. And that was, you know, it takes, a, you know, we have a long generation interval, right, in the beef industry. And sometimes breeding selection just is, you know, so slow, it's painful. Um, but if we could do it, you know, direct fed microbial or something, right, could we change that? So my question is, you know, I know that they worked for forever to try to figure out a direct fed microbial for uh, Megasphera elsdenii, right, mm -hmm, until they mm -hmm. finally figured out how to like freeze dry it and things like that. Mm -hmm. And Correct me if I'm wrong, but that ended up being a strain that was not something that was normally found in the rumen, right? Mm -hmm, and and mm -hmm. part of that challenge was that they needed something that could colonize really, really quickly, yeah. fill that two to three week gap, right? While the starch, you know, and lactate and eventually build up the calf's own Megasphera yeah. Elsdenii population. So for our listeners, yeah. Megasphera is the cool bacteria that helps prevent acidosis in the mm -hmm. rumen because mm -hmm. he grows kind of slowly. He's kind of a slow learner, but he grows um, over the first two to three weeks as we start to put more corn in our uh, feedlot diets, for example. And as he picks up, then he'll eat that lactate and prevent that lactate from accumulating, causing rumen pH to decrease and causing acidosis, which causes all kinds of bad things in the feedlot animal. Yeah, I think this this is another research area which is really important. Is called host derived direct fat microbes or probiotics. So there are two factors behind. Is one factor is if you give direct fat microbes and cattle already have those organisms, you actually cause a negative impact because they're going to com compete. You know, because that's host actually have a mechanisms to attack target the overloaded particular organisms. So so if, if you already have mexfera, you add more mexfera, the existing mexfera will somehow compete with the direct fat organisms. They actually will potentially create a competition environment for the microbes. So this is the one of the most recent research is we need to assess what existing endogenous microbiome and how we potentially provide the proper direct fat microbes. Second is the um, the the host actually, for example, in the gut, host actually can produce secretive IgA and the secret IgA in, in the calves research, for example, they target overloaded organisms. So that's why if the host genetics can have this um, imbalanced secretive IgA production system, uh, which is established by, you know, existing host microbial interaction, if give the animals calves um, probiotics, what happens? Host actually will produce secret IgA to kill those probiotics. So in this way, the probiotics will not be able to stay and colonize. So this is actually one of the fundamental scientific questions we need as a research in the host microbiome area to define what's the best gut environment for animals to be able to 
accept and allow the direct fat microbes or probiotics to colonize. But also after they colonize, they actually create beneficial positive effect to the host, not detrimental effect. Yeah, that's really fascinating. I I mean, I guess I knew about over-colonization protections, but I never had thought about the fact that something we were feeding to actually try to do a benefit could actually be a negative to something if it was already established there. So that's really interesting. Yeah. And sorry, I forgot. I think the third factor is, I apologize for that when, when I mentioned about host, right? So if you feed cattle with probiotics from chicken or porks uh, or uh, pigs or human, they will be passenger, they will not colonize. Gotcha. So you got to find the right ones that are going to be able to do yeah. some establishment. Yeah. Okay. So um, I have no idea if this is going to be a question you can answer or not, but since I've also worked in the field of feed efficiency, I have always wondered about this. Um, so we tend to propagate bull genetics, right? So we have one bull and we can get lots of semen from him and we can breed lots of cows to him, right? And that's a great way to make genetic improvements instead of having to have constant turnover of our cow herd. There's maintenance costs and all kinds of things we don't want to do that for. But I've always wondered about this um, passing of the rumen microbial population from parent to offspring. And I think, well, you know, all that bull really provided was a semen donation, right? And then he's not there, but clearly some of his genetics impact the offspring. But then mom is there and obviously there's vaginal microbes and other things that mm -hmm. the calf gets exposed to during birth. But then there's also, you know, she's licking him and he's licking the same post that she's licked for 10 years because she's been in the herd. Like, what are your thoughts on, do you think that the dam versus the sire could have a different influence on the microbial population of the calf? Um, that, that's a really good question. Um, so um, there's not many study has really done on how potentially, you know, the, the bull genetics have a, um, you know, uh, impact um, on the rumen microbes. But we do see, I think we have done maybe three studies looking at the sire effect. So we can actually group uh, the steers based on, because steers, you know, they're not going to pass the next generation because we only work on steers. So we do see the rumen microbiome significant difference. And, you know, d depends on which sire they come from. So there is a sire effect. And we only just did very recent research trying to look at, but it is in dairy cows. So we actually look at um, rumen microbiome of the dam, the cows, and also offspring. And we look at how much of them can be potentially passed through the calves. And what we uh, see, the trend we haven't published yet, is we see that the heritable rumen microbes are more likely detected in the calves compared to the non-heritable ones. So what is the mechanism behind? We don't know, but we only observed for those heritable ones. We, if they are in the mom, we can actually detect them in the calves, in the rumen. But if they are non-heritable in the mom, the prevalence of detect those organisms actually is very low. So that suggest host must have a mechanisms to select which organisms to survive. So for example, as you, you know, as we discussed, maybe they select organisms produce less lactate, or, you know, they, you know, they actually have less toxins or, you know, invasions to the epithelial wall of the rumen or gut and so on, or potentially they, and they also, uh, you know, stimulate, you know, VFA absorption. And there are some other mechanisms behind some organisms are heritable and they can potentially pass through the generation. Okay. So I think this sets up really nicely for the next topic of conversation, which was early life gut microbiology, right? So you, we were talking a little bit before we started recording um, that this is one of the areas that you're really focused on right now. So tell us a little bit about what you're learning about, like kind of early life gut microbiome. I know you've uh, tracked calves from birth all the way up through weaning. Um, I'm assuming this is kind of part of the study that you're referencing right now too, right? Looking at what mom has versus what the offspring has. Yeah. So, um, so things, uh, so for the feed efficiency work, we've, we actually started 2005 and from 2009, I, I started really interesting about early life colonization in the calves and because there is at the time there there wasn't any uh, research in in the field so what we did first study is we collect uh, gut samples from calves five minutes after birth and then we look at calves at day seven 14 21 and 42 and look at the whole gastrointestinal uh, tract microbiota including rumen and uh, duodenum uh, jejunum ileum colon and 
I guess that that's pretty much we are looking at to look at um, how the microbiota established during the early life and how this establishment can potentially uh, play a role in the gut tissue development, immunity development, and so on. So what we found is after birth, immediately, we can see very diverse uh, micro microbial colonization through the gastrointestinal tract. And um, actually, uh, we also did some study looking at uh, C-section. We collect samples in collaboration with Ireland. We also look at whether there is certain microbial colonization occurred before calving. And the, the, the evidence is, is actually very limited microbial detected in the fetus. This, this is another big theory we can, you know, people debate or argue for a long time. So theoretically, based on our understanding or uh, uh, speculation, we think through that birth uh, a canal that birthing process play a very important role to make the calf exposed to the microbes and they start to colonize. So the early colonization, what we found out is most interesting is very similar to other mammals is the bifidobacteria, which is beneficial organisms are predominant in the calves. And when they grow up, the bifidobacterium reduce, you know, in, you know, in, in E. coli and other, you know, enterococcus and other uh, organisms will start to be dominate. Bifido will be, you know, be eventually uh, getting uh, lowered in the, in, in the gut when they, you know, getting more mature and so on. So we also do see that claustrum feeding can affect uh, the early life uh, colonization. This is another thing that uh, another research area we found the uh, first feeding or the early life nutrition can play a very important role affecting the early life microbial colonization. So on colostrum, we've been thinking a lot about colostrum lately. We're interested in my lab in things like vitamin A. And of course, those fat soluble vitamins are very high in colostrum. And, but colostrum, uh, content, I guess we'll call it, is very different between beef cattle or beef cows and dairy cows, right? Like the dairy cows is so dilute because she's making so much milk compared to the beef cow, right? Like when I have a new calf born, that calf will basically have orange feces for the first like three days, right? Because even by, you know, day two, she's finally moved on to the back quarters and she's finding all new colostrum there, right? <laughs> um, is, have you done work looking at like the different components that are in colostrum that are affecting that early life gut micro microbes in the calf? Um, we have been interested on that perspective, but we haven't done any work. I know uh, Dr. Mike Steele is actually really interesting. Look at different components. Um, the only difference we um, compared actually recently we're interested are the um, exosome uh, component. Um, so exosome is a kind of a protein or lipid particle. They can wrap up with different DNA, RNA fragments. Uh, so how potentially those exosome can um, affect uh, the calf uh, microbial colonization because we do see this is another host of microbiome uh, mechanisms or interaction we identified is we found out some non-coding RNA, which is a small piece of RNA molecules, they can be also uptake by the microbes in the gut, which is those non-coding RNA from host can potentially, you know, regulate the bacterial growth. For example, they can actually target pathogens like fusobacterium, like in human study, or E. coli, they can potentially, depends on which non-coding RNA, RNA molecules, they can potentially boost the growth of the pathogens or incubate pathogens. So, so colostrum, the exosome of the protein particles in the colostrum can be very interesting, you know, how they affect colonization. But of course, other are oligosaccharides, right? Because we know oligosaccharides are the substrate for bifidobacterium, as I mentioned. We found why the Clostrum fed calves have a better uh, uh, or abundant bifidobacterium or more potentially uh, gut health is because the oligosaccharide in the colostrum can potentially stimulate or help bifidobacterium to grow. And also there are other uh, many bioactives, I believe, to really look at how each colostrum component affect, um, you know, we call the pioneer colonization, which are the organisms predominate or, or, or colonize first can be very critical for the, you know, the establishment of the microbiome in the calves. 
Yeah, that's really cool. I think, you know, milk and then obviously classroom is just something that we just don't have much of an understanding of everything that's there and how important it is. And when we have situations like dairy calves or dairy beef calves now, right, that don't get the chance to nurse whenever they want to, we really need to figure out what is the best amount and, you know, time and frequency to give it to them and things like that, right, to make sure that we can give those calves the best chance at early life health. And I think health is another aspect that you have looked at in your lab, right? Like taking some of this mm-hmm. early life gut microbiome work and tying that to kind of calf, I would call it thriftiness as a beef producer, yeah. right? Like I want <laughs> the calf to bounce up. I want him to nurse yeah. in, you know, 30 minutes and then I never want to see him again <laughs> <laughs> in, in the sick pen anyway. <laughs> so what is your, uh, what things have you been looking at on the immune side? Um, we actually look at, for example, the uh, uh, scalp's diarrhea, and we actually also trying to look at potentially the uh, how the early life um, microbiota, um, you know, promote or improve the resilience of the calves uh, in response to other disease. For example, the BRD. Um, we we also because now the recent research uh, indicate there is a gut to lung access, right? So when the gut microbes uh, is dysbiosis, they affect the systemic immunity, like you know cytokine circulation, and certain immune molecules can potentially affect the lung function and so on. So we are we are also interested in how potentially, especially in the, in the in the beef calves, how the early life colonization can potentially, um, you know, um, not only improve their gut health and they are more resilient to the environment, right? Because they they were they were grazed or you know with mother in a different environment, but also how potentially to lower their uh, um, prevalence in you know BRD and other you know viral uh, disease and and so on. Absolutely. Okay. So I'm, I want us to switch gears a little bit and talk about um, another aspect of our research programs that I think we have in common. But before we do that, I want to give you a chance to help our audience understand something that I read a lot in your bio, and that is omics. And I feel like sometimes um, even those of us like myself who do a lot of work with proteomics and metabolomics and things like that, sometimes we still tr- struggle to help producers or health nutritionists and others understand just how important that discovery-based research is to be able to turn it down around to productive things that the beef producer can do. And I know that that's one of your passions, right? That you want to use the discovery side and take it to the application side. So can you help us uh, just maybe high level, understand a little bit about how omics has helped your research program make those important changes for producers? Yeah, yeah, I guess I sometimes have to, um, you know, joke about this all the time. I think you might also heard me talk, right? So, so omics basically just refer to different layer of molecules and or compounds. They are existing in the biological system. So, um, I think because of, um, the technology development. So now it allow us to detect all sorts of layers of molecules or compounds. Like we can detect DNA molecules, RNA molecules, proteins and metabolize, you know, the, the metabolic compounds, enzymes, or even, you know, uh, glycoproteins, uh, gl- uh, glycoproteins and lipids and so on. So I, I think for this different layer of omics, um, the beauty of the is the research and generate lots of data. <laughs> How, you know, I think is the importance of this data is help us to understand systematic, systemically at cellular level, tissue level, and organ level, how those molecules interact together to affecting the traits. So this is for our scientific understanding, right? So for the producers, I guess we, the all mix just to provide scientific foundation. When you do this management, when you do the treatment supplements, how the animals will respond internally at the cellular tissue organ level to make them to be more responsive or less responsive to the management, to the diet, and to help producer to understand, oh, am I worth to invest, right? To, you know, to feed cattle with this expensive probiotics or, you know, supplements because, 
you know, we know that based on their molecular trait, they're not going to be responsive. Or we know this based on their genetics or the, the DNA molecules, RNA molecules, we know this cattle will be inefficient through the life. So should I keep the cattle or not? Well, I guess there is a potential to provide this kind of a scientific foundation to help producers to make more uh, targeted decision or precision feeding or nutrition management decision. It, it's just my goal, but we are still far be, far away uh, from there, I guess. And, uh, because, you know, it really depends on how fast we can detect those molecules, you know, how much information we can provide to the producers. Say, we know this cattle based on their metabolites or DNA molecules, it will be useless to invest, right? <laughs> so. I don't know about you, but I'm kind of hoping that chat GPT or one of the other AI systems that's coming out now is going to get to the point where it can help me do some of that, um, you know, biological pathways building. And I know that there's things out there, but even circling back to our original conversation about being interdisciplinary, I'm still trained as a nutritionist, right? I'm not trained as a geneticist or trained as somebody who has spent a lot of time trying to build a keg pathway or something else, right? To show what these you know, metabolic pathways are doing. So the easier we can make those things, the faster we can make the leap from discovery-based research, understanding why things happen to the point where we can tell producers, okay, these calves from these cows need to go to forage. These calves from these cows need to go to grain. That's going to be the most efficient use of your resources. They're going to be, you know, harvested in the shortest number of days. These guys are going to make the most use of that cover crop, low quality forage, whatever. Like that's my vision for how some of this omic stuff can come into, you know, functionality someday. Yeah, definitely. I totally agree with you. Yeah. Okay. So we're getting near our time to the end, but before we jump to the famous three questions, I want to talk about something I think we're both passionate about, and that is graduate student mentoring. And you have a lot of graduate students. So um, tell me, tell me your secrets, Dr. Guan, tell me all your secrets. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess the one thing is, you know, um, I always put my students as a priority, right? So I'm, I have a passion about how to potentially to be a good mentor to them. So I'm, I work with them as a mentor, as a collaborator, and not always um, as what people consider a, a supervisor, right? So I don't usually give orders. So, But just to summarize, I always tell students uh, a couple of um principles. So I, I, has, I think I have a 5C and a 3P principles. 5C is to be connected, communication, uh, creativity, and oh my gosh, uh, oh my gosh, I, now I, I didn't prepare for that question. So basically, <laughs> I have a 5C and then 3P, I, I, I remember is a passionate, uh, persistent, and practice. So, you know, that's my 3P principle. And um, the students, I think is the most important. I always try to uh, work with students based on each of their strengths and weakness. So I have very individualized approach to try to, provo uh, to provide the best environment for each of them to grow. So I guess this is more like, I wouldn't say precision mentorship, but, uh, but also trying to adopt this kind of a research approach to, you know, mentor the students as well. I actually love that. I think you should, you should make that your tagline, precision mentorship. That's, uh, it could be your fourth P. <laughs> <laughs> that's fourth P. I like that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's really awesome. Have you ever done anything with Clifton Strengths or Strengths Finder? with your students? I, I usually do the, um, you know, all the students before they start to do the uh, SWOT analysis. Okay. The uh, strengths, weakness, opportunity, and threat. That's the SWOT analysis. And they do that every three or six months. And then, you know, then they revisit which strengths they have, you know, further enhanced or which weakness disappeared and what new weak weakness identified and so on. So. I love that. And I, I wondered because you said it was kind of individual approach, right? So I, I'm actually a certified Clifton Strengths coach and I do oh. strengths with all of my graduate students and we're starting to do more. Um, our faculty are doing training this summer. We're going to have our undergrads are going to be doing more training and hoping to do stuff with our graduate students as well. And I have individualization in my top 10 for one of my strengths. And so that I kind of perked up when I heard you say this individual approach, because that's exactly what it is, right? They're not like us. They're different. And that's yeah. totally fine. They're different yeah. in a good way. They've got to figure out what works for them. Yeah. But then um, I also love your passion and persistence, which are kind of part of like Angela Duckworth's um, grit definition, right? Like passion is part of that. 
Yeah, thank you. But I definitely will come back to you and reach you out about the strengths, whatever the uh, uh, approach you are taking. I, I, I would be happy to learn and also adopt the similar approach uh, to the students here as well. Yeah, well, and it sounds like you're doing something really similar with the SWOT approach, and, and I think that's that's really cool. So just helping people understand that we're not all the same and that we do have different strengths. And even I think sometimes these young people, I mean, it makes me feel really old now, right, because they're the new ones, they're like half my age. And I'm like, let me give you my life advice, kid, because nobody told me this when I was your age. And, you know, I feel like I am so much more confident and know myself and I know what I should do and what I should say no to. And those are things that come with knowing how you be your best version of yourself. Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. Okay, well, this has been amazing. We're gonna wrap up with our famous three questions here. Um, so our first question, and you can kind of tweak this as necessary, is um, what is your favorite beef or dairy or ruminant related resource? Well, um, I mean, that's a question, um, you know, actually, um... It's um, maybe I, I would say that um, in resource, when you talk about resource, I guess the animal themselves. <laughs> to me, by seeing the animals always make me think a lot. So I love, it, it, just to be honest, I, I love go sampling. So we still have a continuing ongoing room and sample, sampling. Um, I, I could say maybe as a one individual researcher, I should have the most number of room and samples in the world. We, I have eight minus 80, I think, I have more than 6,000 rumen samples collected <laughs> from beef or dairy and most of beef. So I really love to go to rumen sampling at least one time per year to, with my students. Just go to see the cattle and go to see the farm and is one of the my most valuable you know resource or talk to the farm managers talk to producers i also love to visit dairy farms and talk to farmers it's always my most important resource of course in canada we have the uh, beef cattle research council that's the website they also provide a lot of useful resource i actually uh, actively attend their webinar sometimes is provided by you know the vets and producers and so on some you know, uh, researchers in the ruminant and nutrition area and so on. I agree. That's a great website and a lot of great um, archived resources and stuff on there uh, for producers as much as for anybody else. Mm -hmm. Okay. Question number two, what is a book not related to beef that you're reading right now? Oh, that's a good question. I actually, I, li I, I, I like suspense. So I actually don't remember the name. I, I, I was reading a book um, that is um, uh, talking about suspense. So <laughs> that's the, usually I love to read those uh, uh, fictions that, um, which um, I don't know why I like to read books that um, continue make me thinking or guessing or speculating. <laughs> Nice. Do you have a favorite author that writes suspense? Um, I have, oh my gosh. Um, you know what? I really have a problem to remember people's names. So there are a couple of them I like. So this one is Lisa. Oh my gosh. What's the Lisa? Lisa Gardner. I like Daniel Steele. Lisa, Lisa Gardner. Yeah. Lisa Gardner, Daniel Steele. And, and the third one, Karen Robert. Those are the three of my fav fav favorite authors I read. Nice. Nice. I follow Lisa Gardner on um, Instagram because I have my author stuff too. And she's like a huge hiker. So she's always posting like I, she lives in like New Hampshire or something. She's, she's always posting like hikes at the top of like a 4,000 foot mountain. And it was like a plot hike or something for her. So that's kind of funny. <laughs> I do have plan to read your book though. I, I do. I, I was in my notes and I, I thought that's well be, you know, a, a fascinating thing to learn more about, you know, and, and to be honest, I want to be a writer. Uh, when when I grew up, and however, you know, it, it, this is my uh, you know my my background. So my mom uh, didn't agree with me because I really loved the literature. I like writing, and when I was a teenager, I wrote a lot of poem and you know uh, essays. And I, I, one day I was mad. I actually burned all my dairy because I was uh, kind of against my mom because she didn't want me. She wanted me to go to science. So, so I, I do have a passion actually, yeah, to be a writer. <laughs> That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Well, I think now there's so many good resources and, you know, kind of a sidebar here would be, I've learned so much as I've improved my writing craft. I've brought that back to my graduate students and used mm -hmm. a lot of tips. Like we do writing sprints together on zoom and things like that to like make kind of writing be more normalized. So that's been really mm -hmm. fun. Mm -hmm. Okay. Final question. What's a trait of someone, you know, that has helped them be successful? 
Um, I, I think that that's really,、um, I guess the trade,、um, it, sometimes trade, you cannot use a single word to say, right? So I think it's how、um, individuals can be a balance between the different traits. So for example, when I talk about persistence, right? But you, you can be persistent, but you shouldn't be stubborn. So you, you need to be flexible.、Um, I would say the people always looking for something like optimistic. Um, to be open mind, I think open mind can be really important, right? Especially these days, there are so many information、uh, in the particular field. How you be open mind to welcome, accept new ideas, but also criticism, and in the meantime, digest those information and how to potentially develop some. Of your own idea, and you know, I, I think those are very important traits. Well, I don't think I could have said any of those any better myself. So I think that's an amazing、uh, place to end here. So Dr. Guan, it's been awesome having you on the show, and、uh, thanks again for your time today. You're welcome. Thank you for having me and give me an opportunity to share some of the experience and some ideas. I'm I'm happy to、um, to be part of this and really appreciate、uh, the invitation and also your hosting.